obviously you all know Professor Christensen from yesterday, so without further introduction, you know Clay. Um, but he gave me the opportunity to introduce his co-author, Afoso Adromo, who uh, together have, have written a, a fantastic book that will be published in a few months, which you'll hear about in just a few moments. Um, I met Afosa three years ago as he was finishing up um, at Harvard Business School. Uh, he and I both started working together with Clay. Um, and Afosa began this notion of how can Clay's research on innovation and growth help us understand development and prosperity. And, and Afosa was born in Nigeria and uh, has had a long standing passion for this work. And as with many of you, as including myself, who get to work with Clay, you see the world a little bit differently, and you want to approach a problem in a unique way. And uh, the, when Afosa started his research, I know that Clay said, uh, well, Afosa was going to go to Nigeria to do some field work and do some research, and Clay said to Afosa, if you really want to see how real people live, go find the Mormon missionaries in Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> Just follow them around for a few days, and then you'll know uh, what the real world is all about. <laughs> and he did that. and. A typical year with Clay as a researcher or as a research associate, um, you might produce an article. But Afosa published two cases, a uh, Harvard Business Review article and, and another uh, publication in development. And so we figured out he's a pretty smart guy and, uh, and decided that um, Clay decided he wanted to continue to work and that work has continued and, and results in the book you'll hear about today. Um, so Without further ado, thank you, Clay and Afosa, and we look forward to hearing your talks. Thanks. Thank you. Cliff is my uh, chief of staff, and uh, if you need to do anything in your life, it doesn't really matter what it is, just ask Cliff. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, he does it all, so thank you. You know, most of us have a habit when we're looking at other Americans that this is a, a nation of, of prosperity. It turns out that that's not true. If you go back into the 1850s, uh, America was a desperately poor country. By any measure, America was more impoverished than B Bangladesh is today that America became prosperous. When I was a missionary in Korea, it was viewed by everybody as the most impoverished of the nations of Asia. And uh, I was sent there as a missionary and it was, it just, poverty was everywhere. Uh, and now, as you know, Korea has become quite prosperous and uh, so we decided that there has to has been a process by which several nations in, America, in the world became prosperous. It's not just that they were or they won't. Uh, in the Philippines, uh, 30 years ago, they were a very impoverished nation, and they're still impoverished. So there just has to be something going on process by which this does or doesn't happen. And uh, what we've been trying to do is uh, write this book. I, th I thought, for those of you who uh, have been able to uh, live your life without studying disruption, let me uh, tell quickly why this is important in this context. What we have accustom ourselves to do is to describe every industry by a, a set of concentric circles. And the innermost circles represent uh, industries whose people are, in, are popular, are, are, are wealthy, and, and, under, and, 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 and skilled. And then as you go to the larger circles, they represent larger populations of people who have progressively less money and less, less skill. Until you come to the periphery where people like you and I have lived most of our lives without much of either. 
Almost all industries begin in the center where the people are prosperous and skilled. And the reason is that the first products in most industries are complicated and costs costly. And, and that's the lo logical market for the first products. But innovations that make them affordable and accessible so that larger populations of people are able to have access to them are innovations that we call disruption. And the way disruption works is uh, we put on a vertical axis the vertical, the performance of a product over time. In every market, there's two trajectories of improvement. One trajectory measures the, the trajectory by which customers are able to use products. And the other trajectory describes how innovating companies have provided improvement in those products. And almost always, the trajectory of technological progress outstrips the ability of customers to use the progress. And so uh, those of you who are, have a bit of gray hair, if you uh, go back to the 1950s, um, we had to stop our fingers and let the Intel 286 chip catch up to us about every 15 seconds because our, our fingers couldn't keep pace. The, 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 the fastest microprocessor couldn't keep pace with our fingers. But as Intel produced better and better, more capable products, the, the ability of the processor got to the point where they had overshot what most people can use. In a similar way today, on the left-hand side of the diagram, um, most people look at online learning as something that's not nearly as good as the skilled professors that, that most of us aspire to be. But if you look outside the door 10 years from where we were today, well, I think that online learning has intera intera intersected the ability of teachers to, to, to teach. And it's really quite scary to think that teaching, that, which at one point was, was just our own, uh, and in the very near future will overshoot what we as teachers are able to do. We call these keys innovations sustaining innovations. They make good products better. But there's another type of innovation that we call disruptive innovation. And a disruptive innovation allows the company to do more with less. And by making it affordable and accessible, a, a large, large, much larger population of customers are able to use and improve on those products. And we call that theory disruption because instead of improving the trajectory, it, it disrupts it by making products that are more affordable and accessible, but not as good. And uh, that's the theory of disruption. It, it makes things that are affordable and accessible to become more accessible to a larger population of people. One of the companies that are, have been successful at our disruption is that they make it affordable and accessible. And the people at the high end of the market who make big machines for big people have a very hard time going down market because the profitability just isn't as attractive. And that's the, the essence of disruption. Things that are available and attractive to large corporate clients have a very hard time going down market. Um, we're seeing disruption going on in an interesting place today, and that is with te Tesla car. Because disruption has an opinion about how well Tesla's going to do. We, in, in our work at our school, um, we decided that for reasons that I don't quite yet understand, God has never created data for mankind to use. 
the data that is available is available only at the past. And uh, it's very hard for people who are like you and I, uh, people who want to look into the future, we have a very hard time doing it. But the problem is, God didn't pre create data about the future. And so we had to have some other mechanism by which we did it. And we decided that the only way to see into the future is if we have a, a theory. And a theory is a statement of causality, a statement of what causes what and why. And the nice thing about a theory like disruption is it allows you to look into the future without data. And that's what we're looking at here. So when our students come to class, I ask the students to prepare two things for the class discussion. One is there's a theory that we want to, under, uh, to discuss, like the theory of disruption. And then we want you to put that theory on like a set of lenses and read this case. And when you, as you read the case, I don't want to have your opinion about what's going on in the case. I want to know, does the theory have an opinion about what's going on? Let me say it one more time. We, don't, we ask our students not to come to class prepared to, to talk to each other about who's right and who's wrong on the, the issues at, uh, in the case, but rather we want to discuss, does the theory have an opinion about what's been happening and why and what people ought to do and why? And so in the case of the, the Tesla as a car, uh, I actually don't have an opinion about whether this nation, the, this co uh, company is going to prosper or not. But it turns out that the theory has an opinion about it. And the theory says that Tesla going at the high end of the market is going to find up there that maybe they, they are, in fact, better at making better cars than anybody else. <laughs> But there are going to be other companies up there that don't want to give that up. Companies like Tesla or BMW, Mercedes, Audi. And Tesla can come in and try. But what the theory can predict is that they will be energized, the incumbents, not to give that up. But if you go to the bottom of the market, there are other there are other com companies down there. So the next time you're in Beijing, go outside of the hotel room and go to the right or left about 50 feet. And there you're going to see an electric car. And it doesn't look like a Tesla. It's made out of plastic. And go over and touch it. And it... Uh, it feels different, but it's an electric car. And you might want to take your part comp companion with you in this car, but you can't because it's not wide enough. <laughs> but it's designed for a car that can go in small, in narrow highways, where you just put a little bit of stuff in to deliver it to a, to a uh, local retailer and then they have to go off. And for that application, it's really a remarkable machine. They sell nearly a half a million dollars a year of electric cars. A few of them are sold in America, but the vast majority of this market are in China. And so the theory says that the people that are gonna win this game are companies who are not in Silicon Valley but rather they're people at the bottom of the market in China who are selling it for a, a product that historic for which uh, the, the other option was no car at all. And it's growing very fast. So we'll see. The neat thing about it for me as a professor is I don't need to have an opinion. <laughs> I just have to 
say what's going to happen or what the theory says it's going to happen. And this hasn't just happened in to, uh, working its way through uh, electric cars, but it's happened around the world over and over again. So can you take us through? Yeah. Um, this is a good man. Thank you. And he's smart. Thanks, Clay. I, um, yeah, taking Clay's class um, and working with him over the past few years has, has really changed my life, um, changed the way I see the world, and has given me a lot of hope, which is why we wrote this book. Um, more on that later. But connecting to what Clay said, um, the theory of disruption has taught us that there are different types of innovation. And his research focused on why big companies fail and how upstarts can come in and upend or disrupt big players. But we took that concept and we applied it to the economy. And we were trying to answer this question, where does growth come from? Where does prosperity come from? Does it come when the high-end folks uh, target people with more wealth, more skill, more money, or does it come when businesses, organizations, and, and business models target um, the people at the outer concentric circles? And we tried to understand that. And that gave us a new language um, for understanding that there's not just one type of innovation. Uh, there are three types. And for the language of our book, the first type I'd love to talk about today is called market creating innovations. And these are innovations that make products simple and affordable so that many more people in society can have access to them. In our, our language, in prior th books, we've called this disruption. Right. And now we're talking about market creating innovations, but the same process, making it affordable and accessible so that a larger population of people yes. have access to the products. Yes. And remarkable things happen when uh, you develop innovations for these, uh, this class of people. In our language, we call them non-consumers, right? So these are all the people that are not consuming the existing products on the market. Uh, they are the engines of growth uh, for uh, uh, society as we've, as we've studied them. Now, they create jobs. Um, and they create jobs because when you make a product that targets many more people that haven't historically had access, you don't just need people to make the product, you need people to sell them, distribute them, market them, advertise, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's the first type of innovation. Think about uh, computing 50, 60 years ago. Very expensive, only big organizations could afford them. Uh, today, um, how many people in this room do not have a computer in their pockets? Exactly. Um, and so simple and affordable so that we all could, could get access. A similar thing happened with cars. I mean, we look at cars today as something that, you know, you just you get while you're in college or after college. But about 100 years ago, they were a toy for the rich. And only rich people had access uh, to cars. But Henry Ford took the price of cars from about $10,000 to roughly $3,000 at the time, which is about, uh, sorry, roughly $300, which is about three, $4,000 in today's, in today's dollars. And many more people had access uh, to, to cars. When we were college age, um, we just loved the Toyota Corona because the largest, the, the main population of customers who had very little were high school, high, school high school students like you and I. So thank goodness for Toyota. Yeah. That was one of the first cars I had. You know, and uh, I had an old one, so it overheated all the time. And it, it was, needless to say, I'm, I'm glad I have a better car now. Um, the second type of innovation Clay has talked about, sustaining innovations. These are also very important for economic, uh, for, for economies. They keep economies vibrant, but they make good products better, 
right? Now, with regards to the impact on sort of growth and creating prosperity, they create very little net growth and very few jobs. So think about it this way. If you bought um, a 2010 um, or 2018 uh, Toyota Camry, uh, it means you probably are not going to buy a 2017 or a 2019 Camry. From the standpoint of Toyota, they don't need to build a completely new manufacturing plant if they wanted to upgrade their models. They don't need to have new dealerships, new um, uh, sales channels, distribution, and so on. And, and, and so from the standpoint of how it impacts the economy, it creates little uh, net growth. But they're important because they keep the company vibrant and they keep the economy uh, vibrant as well. Okay. And the third type of innovation, equally important, but has a different impact on the economy, are efficiency innovations. Now, these are innovations that make good products cheaper. They make them uh, more efficiently. And the purpose of this type of innovation is to release cash flows for companies. So this is when you, you know, outsource your manufacturing from one uh, region to another to take advantage of either taxes or lower wages. This is when you use a new technology uh, to improve the efficiency with which you make certain products, but you're still selling those products to the existing customers. One of the markets that allow consulting firms to become pro so prosperous are efficiency innovations. You, as a client, can bring in Deloitte mm -hmm. and say, we'll give you a ton of money, and we need you to increase our free cash flow from this to that. And, and that, those kinds of projects are efficiency innovations. Mm -hmm. And as you're saying, they don't create growth. They mm -hmm. eliminate growth. Absolutely. So that when you look at this population, of three types of innovation, they each have a purpose. Yeah. And we have to meet, remember which is targeted at what. Absolutely. And so, I mean, no innovation here is bad, uh, but we have to understand the purpose, as Clay has said. All right, so I'll give you an example. Um, I'm sure many of you here had, um, had a, you know, maybe a difficult time picking what am I going to wear today, right? Because we have a plethora of different clothing options. That wasn't the case for Americans 150 years ago. Most of us at the time would have one pair of clothing. We would wear it all day, all night, and wash it maybe once a week, once uh, every few weeks. And Isaac Singer, who was an entrepreneur, um, an inventor, figured out how to make the sewing machine simple and affordable. Now, at the time, it took um, uh, women, were the ones who sewed a lot, it took the average woman about a day to get uh, uh, sew a, a shirt. After the Singer sewing machine came on the scene, that time was shrunk to about an hour. And all of a sudden, Singer had a problem on his hands because many people wanted this sewing machine. And so he had to figure out where he was going to find people to make them, to sell them, distribute them, service them, teach people how to make them. And for every job he created in terms of uh, making the sewing machine, about between five to eight jobs were created in the economy. Because now that you've made a lot more sewing machines, you've got many more people who are going into fashion design. You've got many more people who are now servicing the machines, teaching people how to use them, selling them, and so on and so forth. And so that was one of the biggest engines of growth um, in the United States in the mid-1800s. But this didn't just happen in the US. Um, also happened in other countries. One of them is Korea, which is where I left half of my heart. Um, when I got my calling there, by any measure, it was a desperately poor country. And there was a company there called Kia. I don't know if any of you have 
heard of these guys. And uh, at the beginning, they started at the very bottom of the market with simple products that had just three wheels. But that was one less wheel to break. <laughs> <laughs> they sent me home in 1974. And uh, I, I just fell in love with the idea of coming at the bottom of the market. And I studied this every co course that I could at BYU. I then went to BYU, to Oxford, and studied development from the perspective of the low end of the market. I, I studied that in Oxford as, as deeply as I could. Uh, then I went to the Harvard Business School so that I could study it there. And my hope was to get a job at the World Bank and uh, spend my life helping people in, in impoverished nations to, to prosper. And then when I graduated from HBS, uh, the World Bank wasn't hiring Americans that year. And so I had to work for BCG instead. But uh, I've, I've continued to puzzle myself about this why does the low end have this pattern? And it turns out that that's the way it works in industry after industry. And so in the case of Tesla, they started at the bottom. They've gone to the top. The buses were also made by Tesla. You can see on the left-hand side, it had three wheels also. But you could go anywhere in Korea. And uh, you, met, you sat next to a lot of interesting people when you're on the bus in Busan. But in both cases, Tesla, and they have become better and stronger to do more and more. And so Korea became prosperous, but they weren't always prosperous. Um, when you are in Korea, the worst thing you could ever imagine doing to you is to have to be there in July and August when it is just sultry, hot, humid. You spend your life telling people that they should believe our gospel and people just rejected you day after day and you'd go home at the end of the day just sweating buckets. And uh, our stake president, our, our mission president, had figured out how much the minimum language of clothing. clothing the missionaries had to keep on uh, in order to, for them to stay within the guidelines. And so we'd come home at the end of the day and take all the clothing off, put ourselves on the bare floor, and pray to God that he would give us a breeze. <laughs> and you can see there what the breeze, what, what the air conditioner was in Korea was a fan. And then one day, I remember coming out of the door, and they were, they were building a new building, not very big, up the road. So I just went, out, went down to ask these guys what they're about. And the guy said, oh, we have a new industry or a new product. Have you ever seen it? And he, he put this product out, and it was a fan. And it went like this. And I remember thinking, finally, God has answered my prayer. <laughs> And uh, this company is known as Samsung, and they had to hire a few people. But they started in Pusan with a simple product. So I'm from Nigeria, and oftentimes when I meet people, they say, man, Nigeria, you guys have a lot of oil. It's a lot of potential, but you know, still languishing in, in poverty. Well, it turns out that when you begin to look at that industry, the resource extraction industry, through the lens of the three types of innovation, you learn something new. I learned something new. The job of an oil company is not to go into a country 
and create as many jobs as it can and create sales, distribution, advertising, marketing, and so on. Their job is to invest as aggressively as they can in efficiency innovations because they're creating a commodity product that, whose price is set on the world m markets and they want to do it as efficiently as possible. Uh, they want to do it with as little uh, expenditure as possible. So their job is really to eliminate, jo uh, eliminate jobs. Their purpose is to eliminate jobs. And so you begin to find that uh, part of the reason we don't get a lot of growth, jobs, and prosperity from many countries that are focused on resource extraction is because the type of innovation that that industry promotes is primarily efficiency innovations, and that's not the job. One of the biggest insights we learned um, as we were doing this research is the idea of pushing solutions versus pulling solutions. Um, I'll explain what that means, telling a story. But I told him to be sure that you don't go and imagine that what you see in Lagos comes from the perspective of the 16th floor That's of the right. Hilton. That's right. Because you've got to find where, those, where are those missionaries That's and right. let me watch how they, li how they live their lives. That is true. They showed me parts of my country I'd never seen. <laughs> but it was a great, it was a really good experience. Um, ab about 10 years ago, I got a group of friends uh, to start an organization called Poverty Subs here. Now, the reason we did that was um, I went into uh, villages in 2008, and I saw poverty firsthand. Um, I saw this picture was from that trip. So people didn't have access to water. These women had walked miles to the banks of this uh, river to, to wash clothes. And I felt it was sort of my duty. I was in the US, and I was um, prosperous. It was my duty to provide them with water. So I got a group of friends together, and we raised money, and we built a well. Pushed the well onto the community. A few months later, I got a call that the well was broken. I was back in the US, and I wasn't sure really how to fix it. And then, as we started doing this research, uh, we realized that a lot of solutions to development follow this approach. We see a lack of water, and we say, well, let's provide wells. A lack of education, OK, the answer's got to be schools, so we provide schools. Lack of health care, we build big hospitals and try to find where doctors are. Lack of infrastructure and roads and bridges and so on. And even a lack of honesty. And so what is corruption, right? In, in many poor countries, we try to teach them institutions and laws and so on. And we're pushing, spending billions of dollars, pushing, pushing, pushing these solutions. But they often are not sustainable. Um, they don't create the kind of prosperity that we'd hope. A different way to think about it, right, is the concept of pulling. Now on the screen, you see a 20 cent pack of noodles. So it's sort of like ramen noodles, which I'm sure many of you ate while you were at BYU or in college. Uh, but this is our version in Nigeria. That's a 20 cent pack of noodles. And 30 years ago, two brothers decided to go to Nigeria and create a new market for noodles. At the time, many Nigerians thought they were being fed worms because we didn't. We didn't eat noodles. It wasn't a staple food. But over time, they have made this product simple, affordable, and accessible to millions of Nigerians. And just look at all the things it has pulled into the economy. It has created thousands of jobs, enabled tens of thousands of other jobs. It has brought in close to half a billion dollars in investment in the country, run 13 factories, they fund uh, electricity. They create electricity for their factories, water treatment, sewage, and so on. And that began to give us the idea that pushing solutions is not the best way to get prosperity. Instead, if we create products that are simple and affordable, target a mass, um, a mass of people in society, 
as we create those markets, they're going to pull in many of the things that our reaction just sort of tells us to push. It didn't just happen in Nigeria. So we profile a lot of different innovations in the book, um, one of which is a, a chain of diabetes clinics in Mexico. So many of you may not know, but Mexico has a huge diabetes problem. Um, uh, but it's also really expensive to treat the, the, the disease. And the average Mexican can't afford uh, the treatment. It costs about $1,000, and they have to go to different, different uh, clinics. And the guy who started Clinicas de la Zucar was actually a former student of Clay's. I have to tell the whole story. <laughs> you do. <laughs> so it's a very capable man who came to Mexico from Monterrey. And uh, Harvard didn't let him in. And it just didn't feel right. This is a very capable guy. And so I talked to the head of our admissions, and he, she wouldn't budge. And it made me mad. And so I decided I'll offer my course at MIT instead, which I did. She did. <laughs> and, and this guy went to the SSE through the back door of the it's M MIT. MIT. Yeah. Not as good as Harvard, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he took the course there, and he learned the different theories in the class. And he said um, he had an idea before he took the course to go back to Mexico, create a nonprofit, ask for donations so that he could fund diabetes treatment for uh, many people who were suffering from this. this the disease. Um, his mom also suffered from diabetes. Um, after he took the course, he said, um, I'm going to change my idea. Instead of starting a, a nonprofit and figuring out how to fund diabetes care for many of uh, the, my, my fellow citizens, I'm going to create a business model that makes it simple and affordable so that many people, many more people can have access to diabetes treatment. And now he has created uh, the largest chain of diabetes treatment in Mexico. It's growing um, uh, gangbusters. Um, and they're treating tens of thousands of Mexicans every year. He has reduced the cost of diabetes treatment from a little over $1,000, where a patient would have to go to different hospitals and clinics, meet with different specialists, uh, to roughly $250. Um, and he has created an integrated solution where you go into one clinic and you meet with all the specialists you need to meet with. He's creating hundreds of jobs. But what's interesting is he's now inspiring copycats. <coughs> so all the people who said, oh, this would never work. What are you doing? It's not going to happen, um, are now copying his business model. And that's one of the most impactful things that happens when you target non-consumption, create a new market, and have a business model uh, that's successful? It's, uh, I always wondered, why, why does Mexico struggle to prosper? And they're doing much better than they have done historically. But nonetheless, you, you wonder, why did this happen? And the model of disruption has really helped us because what it helped us see is that companies in America that look at Mexico as, a, as an opportunity for efficiency innovations can put their money into Mexico and suck it up for everything that they have. And then if there is a cheaper place to make it, in Vietnam, the money just picks itself up, goes around, goes down there, do, and creates efficiency innovations there. But very few of these investments were to create local permanent jobs where the people who are in the ground designed the products by Mexicans, uh, manufactured them by Mexicans, efficient, uh, di di distribute them by Mexicans. 
And those kinds of innovations are permanent. They're permanent. Whereas the Mexicans that come in is in as efficiency innovations can be very temporary in character. Uh, and so it, it's been uh, interesting to see where uh, this might lead. Um, one of the most uh, inspiring things to look at is, is there non-consumption? Ifosa mentioned this as a concept. Remember, I, we offered the three circles. And uh, what you have to do to see opportunities in growth in this way of thinking is to look at the outer circles and ask yourself, is there a place in Nigeria or Peru where there is non-consumption? Meaning people need to compute, but they don't have a computer or they need a car to get this from here to there, but there's no car. And we call that non-consumption. Uh, if you just go up with your calculator and a, a check, uh, uh, you, 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 you calculate how much consumption there is. But when you see consumption, it's rare that we'll turn ourselves around from the other perspective, which is, where is there non-consumption? In, in many insta instances, the size of the non-consumption market is actually a lot bigger than the market for consumption. And thinking about it in that way is really important. Well, you guys have been patient with us. Um, one question or two, and then you, you need to get us off the stage, so, sorry. Yeah, we've got a few more minutes. We've got extra time for lunch, lunch too. <clears throat> yes, you have a question? Yeah, hi. Uh, did you look at all at structures that facilitate this type of innovation? For example, maybe you have a great idea and you're looking at the non-consumers, but I'm thinking of Spain where my wife's family is. I know lots of people with probably could innovate, but the, the municipalities, the, the political structure, the appetite for credit, these other things prohibit the innovation from actually coming to market. Yeah. Can you get all, at, at that at all yet? Yeah, we, we, we have. And um, the answer is that when you run into really complicated problems like you've articulated, this the most important straightforward answer is to quit your job and become a professor at the Harvard Medical <laughs> because all we have to do is talk we don't have to do anything <laughs> but there's a th there's of the theories in our t toolkit can help us with that and uh, three of them are in particular important and there's a, a book about this called Competing Against Luck that would be helpful for you. So the first one is you need to find is there non-consumption? Because if there's non-consumption, it's hard for the, Mexic for the government to stand in the, the way of non-consumption. Then there needs to be um, interdependencies. Because almost always, when an innovation fails, it's not that that ste step in the process failed, but something right next to it in the stack failed, because you never thought about it before. And so it appears as if the government is standing in its way. In reality, it is, duh, you know, we should have thought about this or that or that. And so finding opportunities where it is non-consumption and where there are not too many interdependencies. But that's a great question. Thank you. So, yes. Real quick. Is this going to be an, a useful question? <laughs> a useful question? <laughs> OK, we'll judge. <laughs>
So um, it's not inaccurate, but it's incomplete, right? Um, after the Asian tigers, so Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, were emerging as big powerhouses. Uh, economists said, look at how they've grown. They looked at the macro numbers and said it's been export-led growth. And so that became the dominant economic theory that, that was pushed to uh, other countries. Industrialize, create exports, and you're going to grow. Before that, it was import substitution policies. And then they tried that in Latin America. It didn't quite work. And it's like, OK, it's now export-led growth. And they've been trying that, and it's not working. The critical piece that they're missing is it's not just about attracting capital, building factories, creating efficiency innovations, but it's about creating local markets, creating the distribution, sales, marketing, and so on, that actually leads to growth. But that also leads to learning. It leads to. Uh, organizations in countries no longer exporting just T-shirts or mosquito coils and so on, but they're now exporting more sophisticated products and services. And so if I just uh, end with it, if you look at Singapore, Singapore is, is, is an interesting country because um, it's small, and when you look at the numbers, it's all export. Right? It's, uh, they've, they've grown largely through exports. But when you start to look at what they were exporting 50, 60 years ago, they were exporting T-shirts, toys, mosquito coils. But today, you have biotech companies that have the headquarters there, BMW, Novartis, and so on. And so that just export-led, efficiency-based growth, it's not inaccurate, but it's incomplete. I and would I say it's incomplete. But most importantly, it's, it's correlation, not causality. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what we're trying to, a theory is useful if people find opportunities to just to uh, find anomalies to the theory. And we have to fight that as we develop this new theory of disruption is, it, um, it, 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 we have to find co correlation and supplant it with causality. Yeah. Well, you guys, uh, thanks for your help to be here. Um, we still are working at Harvard. I think this book comes out in January. And uh, in contrast to some of the other books whose primary purpose was to fall, make you fall asleep when you read it at night. I think this is going to be a good book. I hope so. God bless you.